Okay. Uh, thanks very much um, for coming, everyone. So I'm going to provide um, a bit of background about uh, my research and some of the research I've been involved in over the last uh, several years, and then also um, talk a little bit about some of my future research, so some of the stuff, the projects I've currently, currently got going and uh, where I'd like to go with this research into the future. So my research themes, uh, my research basically falls into two broad themes, one of which is um, uh, what determines biodiversity patterns on Earth? So this is really a fundamental um, sort of question in ecological um, science. And then secondly, um, so, sort of to apply this research into how we can most effectively conserve uh, biodiversity in ecosystems. And my research has a particular focus on mesophotic coral reefs, um, but it's not exclusively focused on that. I've done work in a lot of different ecosystems and things like that, but this is a, a field that I find particularly in interesting and that I've been working on a lot over the last several years. So within my research, uh, my broad research themes, I have a number of different questions that I'm interested in. Uh, firstly, just how do species distribute themselves along environmental gradients? And this is a really important question because understanding how species respond um, along environmental gradients can tell us a lot about, um, about their ecology and how communities and ecosystems work and how they might respond to change. Um, a very basic question, what species occur on mesophotic coral reefs? Because uh, we know very little about this. We know a lot about shallow water coral reefs and not a lot about what lives uh, down a little bit deeper. Um, what ecological and environmental factors influence the distribution of species, uh, particularly in mesophotic habitats, but in uh, coral reefs and then marine ecosystems more broadly? And then all of these questions lead into these more applied uh, side of research that I do. So things like how will environmental change affect species and ecosystems? And then things like how is conservation effort uh, distributed spatially. So how do we prioritise uh, limited conservation funding to try and uh, affect conservation of um, these ecosystems that I'm interested in looking at? So all of these questions come together in how can this knowledge inform management of biodiversity, uh, sorry, management and conservation of biodiversity. And another tool that I'd like, I'm really interested in is how we can harness new technologies which is developing very rapidly uh, to better understand and conserve biodiversity. So this is sort of the broad um, spectrum of research questions uh, that I'm interested in with my research. Uh, today, I haven't got time to talk about all of this research, so I'm just going to focus on a couple of them. Uh, so what species occur on mesophotic coral reefs? And then using this research to try and look at some of these more applied questions, so how is conservation effort uh, distributed and how can we use this knowledge of all this biodiversity research uh, that we're doing uh, to inform conservation and management? So what determines patterns of species diversity? So in 2005, um, Science, as part of their 125th anniversary, published 125 of the most critical questions in science. And this, what determines patterns of species diversity, uh, was one of these questions. So it's a really key uh, question in ecology. And we know that biodiversity is distributed along uh, various environmental gradients. So they could be latitudinal gradients that operate at global scales. Uh, we know that species, tend, species richness tends to be higher in the tropics and decline as you go towards the poles. It could be uh, altitudinal gradients, so as you go up a mountain you have various um, patterns of species richness and um, other measures of diversity. And then my obvious interest is especially in depth gradients in the sea. And uh, some of these are, uh, there's some interrelationships between some of these, but there's a lack of consensus on the underlying mechanisms that generate these species richness uh, and diversity gradients. And it's not just an esoteric exercise, so I'll be um, coming back to this point throughout the talk, that it's also important for applied issues. So things like, uh, for example, the spread of invasive diseases and response to climate change, it's really important to understand how species uh, respond along to environmental gradients. And tropical areas are particularly critical because um, they have very high biodiversity um, currently, they have very high levels of species loss and habitat degradation and fragmentation and these sorts of issues. So it's very important to understand um, why we have such high species richness in the tropics and what influences the distribution of species. So depth diversity gradients on coral reefs. So many of you would do research on coral reefs and go to places like Lizard Island and so forth. And most of you would probably only study the top five or 10 metres of coral reefs. So you go up to Lizard Island and you'll have your sites in the lagoon or maybe a trimodal or Vicky's Reef or somewhere like that. 
Um, but the thing is, if we look at how biodiversity is distributed with depth on coral reefs, this is for fish on the Great Barrier Reef, but it can apply to lots of other different uh, organisms and in lots of other different sites. We find that these shallowest areas often um, have lower biodiversity than these sort of intermediate depths. And this sort of hump-shaped pattern is often quite common uh, when we look at uh, how biodiversity distributes over depth and also with altitude and things like that. So this hump-shaped distribution is quite common. Um, this is an example from Chagos Atoll for corals. Again, um, its diversity is measured in a slightly different way. Um, this is old data, but essentially you can see that it's a relatively similar pattern, both on the, the outside of the reef, inside the lagoon. Uh, essentially, we're having this, we, we get this hump-shaped pattern. And it's important to understand how species are distributed across depth and how relative abundances of species changes across depth. Because important ecological processes like dispersal and mortality and growth and things like that all vary across, across depth gradients. And we know this. We also know that the, the frequency and severity of disturbances, so things like bleaching and cops and storms, also varies across depth. So understanding these relationships is important for predicting how species may respond to change in the future. The problem is that we've got a chronic under-exploration of deepwater coral reefs. So basically, especially once we get below 30 metres, um, we really have very little idea about uh, the biodiversity and particularly the ecological processes that are operating in these deeper habitats. So to most people, if I, when you look at a mesophotic reef, this is what it will look like. They're often a long way offshore. A lot of the time they're located on submerged banks, so the top maybe 30 or 40 or 50 metres below the surface. And so, you know, this is generally what that looks like to a lot of people. Uh, this is more what a mesophotic reef looks like for me. Uh, this is up in Papua New Guinea. Uh, they're incredibly uh, diverse and beautiful marine ecosystems. <coughs> and they're very interesting because of that fact that they're so, unstu so unstudied and so poorly known. So just a little bit of terminology first. Um, so throughout this talk, I'm going to be referring to both submerged reefs and mesophotic reefs, and they're not interchangeable terms. So submerged reefs are basically reefs uh, that do not approach sea level. So this is an example from the northwest shelf. And uh, you can see here, this is Western Australia, and this is Timor in Indonesia. This is the northwest shelf. And basically, this red and, and yellow indicates uh, predicted reef habitat in this area. Now... The black areas indicate dry land, and you can see there's two of these, what we call emergent reefs. These are really classic atolls, Scott Reef and Ashmore Reef, uh, beautiful big atolls, sandy lagoons and uh, islands, reef islands, coral caves, things like that. But you can see that only a tiny fraction of this reef habitat is actually occupied uh, by these shallow water reefs. All the rest of this is actually submerged banks, and we're finding that these banks now are incredibly diverse ecosystems. They're very important for, um, for fish and uh, particularly for you know, large pelagic fish and things like that. And actually, there's about 20 times more habitat below 20 metres on the northwest shelf than there is above, the north, above 20 metres in this particular region. So these submerged banks are very uh, common and they're very diverse ecosystems that we currently know very little about. So mesophotic reefs are slightly different. Um, they, can be, they can be the same, but... Basically, mesophotic reefs just refers to reefs that are in the middle to lower sections of the photic zone. So the upper level for a mesophotic reef is taken as being about 30 metres generally, but there's no biological reason for that. That's basically how deep we're allowed to dive. So people, once you get below 30 metres, <coughs> then it's mesophotic. And that's just been a term that's been adopted. Um, <coughs> so some of these submerged reefs may be mesophotic if they're in those depths. Um, but basically, once you have... Coral reef could be a lower reef slope of an atoll or something like that. Once you get below about 30 metres depth, you're into the mesophotic zone. And the mesophotic zone is generally considered to extend um, down about as deep as photosynthesis can occur. So in clear tropical areas, that might be down to 150 or 200 metres or more. So the significance of mesophotic reefs. So uh, mesophotic reefs, particularly in these sort of shallower upper mesophotic depths, so down to 50 or 60 metres, contain many of the species that you'll be familiar with in shallow water. So a lot of the species of fish and corals and probably lots of other species <coughs> you don't really know because uh, no one's ever studied them. But basically these shallower areas contain a lot of the same species that you'd be familiar with from shallow water reefs. Uh, but they also contain, they're very unique because they contain uh, a lot of what we call these depth endemic species that only occur in this very narrow band in the mesophotic. 
And these are just three examples, and all three of these I've chosen because these are all species um, that we've found in our research that have been new records for Australia. So firstly, this is a Acropora tenella, which is one of these deepwater Acropora species, uh, which was previously only known from the Coral Triangle, but we've now found it in multiple uh, parts of Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, this is a pygmy seahorse, um, Hippocampus denise, again only previously known from the Western Pacific, we collected it from about 100 metres depth in the Coral Sea. And this uh, Odontanthius tapui, this is a, a deepwater planktivorous fish. And again, previously it only been known from French Polynesia, and we recently reported uh, for the first time that this species um, clearly also occurs at Osprey Reef in the Coral Sea in Queensland. The other reason mesophotic reefs have um, generated a lot of attention is that they have the potential to um, act as refuges for shallow water species, these depth generalist species from environmental stress. And this is a schematic diagram that we published in uh, Nature Climate Change a few years ago uh, that basically just illustrates, um, conceptualises this deep reef hypothesis. So um, essentially, there's, you know, as we all know, there's many threats facing coral reefs at the moment. But many of these pressures, particularly things like sedimentation and coastal development and fishing pressure, tend to be concentrated in the areas that are easily accessible to people, so close to shore and in the shallow steps. So we can see this indicator was red colour here. And then also some of these disturbances like storms and bleaching and whatnot tend to diminish with depth. So these deeper areas on these submerged banks may provide a refuge for many of these species um, from these sorts of threats. Uh, the second part of this hypothesis, which is indicated by these arrows, is that potentially these areas can uh, provide sources of larvae to reseed these shallower areas following a disturbance. So there's a lot of research going on into this question at the moment. I won't go into that in too much detail. We haven't solved the problem yet. There's a lot of seems to be a lot of geographic variability and things in the extent to which this happens. So how do we study mesophotic reefs? There's been a very large um, increase in research effort on mesophotic reefs. And this has largely been driven by, um, in, by improvements in technology over the last decade or so. So this is the main tools that we use for, meso for mesophotic research. This is an autonomous underwater vehicle, or an AUV, and essentially it's like an underwater drone. Um, it's completely untethered to the ship, so we drop this in the ocean, we pre-program it and go off into the ocean for up to eight hours, ten hours or so, it comes back with um, beautiful stereo images of the seafloor. It also collects a lot of environmental data, so things like temperature and chlorophyll and salinity and all these sorts of things. And, um, and so it's, it's geo-reference to the ship, so it's very useful for repeat surveying of habitats and things like that. This is a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, which is quite similar, um, except that the main difference is that it's actually tethered to the ship, so you can actively drive it around with a little remote control. And um, this, uh, it collects a lot of the same sorts of data, so it's got video and it's got um, you know, temperature and things like that. It's also got this little arm, so you can drive around and you collect specimens from deep water. And then this is another technique that's used quite a lot. This is a, um, a closed circuit rebreather, so technical diving, and this is becoming more and more common in many parts of the world. Um, the huge advantage, this is Richard Pyle, who's a fish taxonomist in Hawaii. And um, he's one of the, the world leaders in mesophotic um, fish research. Uh, he's described many, many new species because he spends half his life diving down between depths of 100, 150, 180 metres collecting fish. And when you go collecting fish there, you tend to find that every five or ten minutes you find something that's undescribed. So he describes these huge numbers of new fish. And the way that he's able to do that is by using this, uh, this closed circuit rebreather. And essentially all it is is when you normally go diving, you exhale bubbles. What a closed circuit rebreather does is it actually recirculates your bubbles. You have a CO2 scrubber in your backpack here, and basically it removes the CO2 from the air that you're breathing out, and so you can keep breathing the same air. So once you're not losing your air to the water, you can stay down there as long as your CO2 scrubber keeps removing your CO2. So that can be 10 or 12 hours. So even if you go very deep, and you have to do a very long uh, trip back to the surface. Um, that's not a problem if you're using this sort of gear. These are just um, extra bailout tanks that he's got just in case anything goes wrong. So they're the main tools that we use. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about a couple of um, areas that I've particularly focused on over the last few years in my research. Firstly, what species occurs on mesophotic coral reefs? So 
This is one of my study sites from my PhD. This is Hydrographer's Passage, which is in the central Great Barrier Reef. It's about 200 kilometres offshore from the Whitsundays. Um, you can see just here. And where we are here, this is a bathymetric map of the Great Barrier Reef outer shelf in this region. And where we are here is we're about 12 kilometres seaward of the outer shelf reefs. And you can see the depth scale here. So this is about 200 metres. And uh, the tops of these shoals are the shallowest there at about 15 to 20 metres depth. And basically what we have is this series of reefs as we go down the shelf. Now all these reefs were formed during lower sea levels because as sea level moves up and down during the ice, during, uh, ice age and glacial into glacial periods, it doesn't do so at a constant rate. It tends to do so quite rapidly and then it'll stabilise for a little while. And where it stabilises, we start getting these reefs on the outer shelf. And so this is where the Great Barrier Reef would have existed uh, during glacial cycles when the sea level was a lot lower. And then as sea level rises, these reefs become what we call drowned, um, but they now provide habitat for mesophotic coral communities. So this is just an example of the zoning of this same region, the Hydrographer's Passage. These blue areas represent the areas that we uh, know support reef habitat. So this is the outer shelf reefs in this region. A couple of the tops of these shoals we know um, support reefs, but there's this huge area that was just this big, vast expanse of outer shelf um, into reef habitat. But when we map it in high resolution, we can actually see that the, uh, reef that the outer shelf contains a large amount of reef habitat. And just an example for these shoals, we put the AUV down uh, to do some surveys on this particular shoal, and these are some of the images that, uh, that it returned. Um, this is uh, very much, these would be very familiar um, sorts of images. So most of you guys that work on coral reefs, um, Acropora dominated communities, some of these soft corals, again, plating, branching acroporas. So all of this reef habitat that's out there that's not currently mapped or regarded as reefs is potentially supporting a large amount of coral reef biodiversity. So how much deep habitat is out there? So this was a study that um, I was involved in, um, along with scientists from Geoscience Australia and the University of Sydney. Uh, it was published in 2012. And essentially, we looked at some newly generated um, bathymetric data from the entire Great Barrier Reef and tried to say, well, how much of this habitat is out there? And basically, um, these, these guys are largely geologists and geomorphologists, so they're in, interested in all these different types of banks and what their morphology is. But the essential message out of this is that there is a huge amount of, of reef habitat out there that occurs on these deep banks. There was about 1,500, uh, over 1,500 of these banks out there the mean depth was about 20 meter, 27 metres, so a lot of reef habitat around about that depth. And the total area was about 41,000 square kilometres. So if we think about you know, the coral reef area on the Great Barrier Reef, it's currently regarded as being about 20,000 square kilometres. So if we include this deep habitat as being you know, potentially coral reef habitat, we're effectively doubling the amount of reef habitat that is out there on the Great Barrier Reef. So all this habitat's out there. The next obvious question was, well, what lives on it? So, for my PhD, uh, we did a month-long trip on the Southern Surveyor, which is a big 70, 80 metre ship um, run by the Australian Government, and we did some dredging. That was the way that we collected physical specimens on this particular trip. And I focused on two particular groups, which was the um, octocorals and also the hard corals. So, for the octocorals, we found that uh, from just these 23 dredges, so not particularly long, 23 dredges, and we found 29 genera, and five of these are new records for the Great Barrier Reef. So octocoral taxonomy isn't resolved anywhere near as well as the hard corals, surprising as that might seem. Um, but we did find that um, even at the generic level, there was this incredible diversity of octocorals on the outer shelf of the Great Barrier Reef. And to put that number in perspective, uh, this is from Fabricius et al. 2008, and they surveyed 1,257 shallow transects all along the Great Barrier Reef, and they only found 30 genera of octocorals in all those surveys. So it's incredibly diverse. Um, this here is Heliania, which is, um, we, that was one of the species that was a new record for the Great Barrier Reef, um, and we now know it's actually really common if you go down deep enough. It's um, one of the most abundant species. The other group that we really looked at was the Sclerotinian corals, the hard corals, and um, we found numerous, uh, well, three new records. This was just um, the original surveys that we did in 2007. Three new species records, including this one, Acropora elegans, which is another species that only previously been recorded from the Coral Triangle. Uh, we extended the lower depth limits for many species, 
And we're adding to this list of species that we're re reporting in the mesophotic zone pretty much every time we go down and have a look. Not only that there's uh, species that are new records for the Great Barrier Reef, species that are new records for Queensland, but also species that we thought only occurred in shallow water that we actually are now finding um, live much deeper than we previously thought. So the next question I had was, well, is there any consistency? Can we predict where we get different types of mesophotic communities on the Great Barrier Reef? And over a few years during my PhD, I managed to uh, visit mesophotic reefs across a large area of the Great Barrier Reef. And this was published in 2012, so we've managed to visit a few more sites since then. And we basically found that it's, you can reasonably accurately predict where you find two different types of communities. So one is a phototroph-dominated community and the other is a heterotroph-dominated community. So uh, the phototroph-dominated community tends to occur in the upper mesophotic, which is now defined as being about 30 to 60 metres. So we're looking at things that are phototrophic, so corals and phototrophic soft corals and things like that. In the lower mesophotic, so once you get down below 60 metres, we start moving into this heterotroph-dominated community. And in this region, it's particularly Gorgonians. And working with other scientists that have been studying mesophotic reefs in other parts of the world, we found that this 60 metre uh, sort of depth contour seems to be a really important um, biogeographic barrier throughout the tropical ocean. So there seems to be um, a lot of places, even in the Atlantic Ocean, there seems to be this very significant changeover of fauna at around about 60 metres depth. And uh, some of this is described by uh, Yossi Lawyer in an upcoming uh, theme section um, on mesophotic reefs in the general coral reefs. So we found that you can reasonably easily predict where you find these sort of phototroph dominated mesophotic communities and then the tetratroph dominated ones. But um, what we did find was that there was a lot of biogeographic variability in the actual taxa that contributed to these communities. So this is just an example in the northern Great Barrier Reef. This is at 40 metres. It's very much a hard coral dominated community here. Whereas in the, uh, this is the Hydrogenous Passage again, down towards the south, very much dominated by soft corals. Once we get down into the, the deeper areas, so this is between 100 and 110 metres, the communities become a bit more similar, um, very much dominated by these Gorgonians. Uh, but there's also a few other things like sponges, black corals like this one here. And there is still hard corals, but they're very much specialised hard corals, not very uh, diverse communities of hard corals, but very much these deep specialists tend to occur uh, at these depths. So there's been a lot of arguing over the last sort of 10 years or so about where the mesophotic zone does it start. Does it start at 30 metres? Does it start at 40 metres? Uh, it's relatively semantic because, it, as we've said, it's largely determined by how deep people are allowed to dive rather than by any uh, biogeographic uh, or biological reason. Uh, but one of the questions we had was, well, where does the mesophotic zone end? And this is some work that we recently published from Osprey Reef in the Coral Sea, where we managed to get a very large um, ROV um, from Germany and working with a, a team from, from Germany. Uh, we studied the depth donation of the benthic assemblages at Osprey Reef down to about 700 metres. And what we found was that the mesophotic community tended to extend to about 200 metres depth. And then below that you had this very barren surface. So I don't know if any of you have seen yet the um, upcoming BBC series from the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, but you'll see David Attenborough actually gets in a, in a submarine and goes down at Osprey Reef, down North Holland, at this exact site. And he goes down about 300 metres and he goes through the mesophotic and then he sort of ends up in this uh, sort of area and says, oh, well, we're down at 300 metres now, it's fairly barren, there's not a lot here, and he goes back to the surface. But if he continued on, he actually would have found that, the, that once you get below about 350 metres depth, you start getting into this cold water community. And this break is caused by... Um, by the depth of the thermoclines, which tends to fluctuate a bit, but generally between about 200 and 300 metres. And so because the, the thermocline is fluctuating, um, it's, it, it causes this, this area that's very... Um, where basically tropical fauna aren't able to live when the thermocline is shallow and um, vice versa, cold water corals can't live when the thermocline is deep. But once you get below this area of fluctuating thermocline, you're in a very, very cold sort of sub-Antarctic mode water, so only up to four, five, six degrees, and we start getting a lot of these very interesting uh, deep water coral communities. Um, this in out at Osprey Reef, and these are likely to occur throughout um, both the outer shelf of the Great Barrier Reef and also uh, out in the Coral Sea. 
So this was really interesting uh, during my PhD. I was, you know, out there and finding all these really interesting things and all these new records and stuff like that. Um, but I'm also interested in knowing, all right, there's all this amazing biodiversity out there. How can we use this information to help uh, conservation? So in the last few years or last few months, there's been a lot of um, debate or a lot of um, stuff in the media, really, about conservation of the Great Barrier Reef. And a lot of this has been spurred by you know, port developments and dumping dredge spoil and stuff like that. And protection of the Great Barrier Reef um, has a lot of support from the general public, not just here in Townsville, Queensland, but all around Australia. The Great Barrier Reef is very much loved by Australians. And so when these campaigns are going on, we see a lot of these sorts of photos of these beautiful shallow reefs with turquoise waters and things like that. And it's very easy to stir up people's emotions and um, have them become you know, very passionate about conserving this sort of stuff. And that's fantastic. But then what about these areas? You know, it's much harder to try and get people to be very passionate about conserving things that they can't see. So what tends to happen is this sort of situation here. So when the Coral Sea campaign was going on, I did a bit of work with the Australian uh, Marine Conservation Society, basically trying, just providing them with information about the sort of things that were occurring at Osprey Reef, because the proposed marine reserve essentially did this. So you can see this is the area that's protected, uh, you know, a few little clownfish and reef fish and corals and stuff like that, and that's good. But this huge area of reef that supports, you know, all these diverse communities of Gorgonians and Nautilus and sharks and manta rays and barracuda and dive as I am, all of these areas were completely unprotected. And this, this came out in about 2011, but I was actually really impressed because once we actually started looking at this area, it was actually really accurate. Like, it's exactly the same sorts of things. <laughs> this is Osprey Reef down at about uh, 70, 80 metres depth, and uh, that's what it looks like. It's absolutely beautiful. So when we're looking at conservation, there's two main reasons that conservation efforts tend to, to fail or, or not be implemented. One of these is the argument, well, there's not enough data to support MPAs. The argument that there's absolutely no reason, no evidence to put in an MPA unless we have exhaustive scientific data on exactly what's there and we can prove that that area is unique enough uh, to be able to warrant, uh, basically, the implementation of protected areas. And some governments are quite sympathetic to this particular view. The other thing, if sometimes, you know, marine reserves in a large part of the population are actually... Um, uh, quite well supported. Um, but what can happen in these situations is sometimes governments will go out and declare very large marine protected areas, or VLMPAs. So you say, oh, we've got a marine protected area we've declared, and it's 10 billion square kilometres. It's the biggest one in the world. It's absolutely fantastic. It's going to do all this stuff. Um, but the problem is, as Bob Cressy continually points out, uh, that a lot of these areas are what we might call residual reserves. So they're often placed in areas that are potentially politically expedient, that have um, very few threats. And really the idea of marine protected areas is to put them in areas where they actually protect biodiversity. So uh, this is an example of, from uh, Australia of the marine reserve networks. And um, you know, Bob has created the argument that, that a lot of this is really um, an area of residual reserves. So they're not being as effective as they could be. So, when I was doing all this work on mesophotic biodiversity, I you know, would constantly go and speak to management agencies like Abrunta and say, oh, look, we're finding all this awesome stuff and you've got all this biodiversity that you didn't know about and all these habitats and isn't this fantastic? You know, it's really exciting. And they said, oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, how did our rezoning go in 2004 at protecting all of these habitats, these mesophotic reefs and deep waters and stuff like that? And what we actually found was that even though they didn't know that a lot of these habitats were there, some they didn't know about at all, some they sort of had some idea there's something out there, we don't really know a lot about it or where it is exactly. Uh, but what we found is that um, we basically looked at 39 different habitat types that we've identified since this rezoning. And we found that for basically all of them, they managed to achieve their target of 20% um, representation of each habitat type uh, without even really knowing they were there. So they protected them incidentally. So how did they do that? Um, basically what they did is they spread their no-take areas across biophysical gradients. 
And they also explicitly consider the potential for unknown features. So if they're looking at the outer shell, we've got this huge area, we don't really know what's there, there's probably stuff, so we better, it's probably not the same up here as it is down here. So we better actually spread our reserves across and along the shelf so that we can capture uh, this heterogeneity. And so they actually did that very well. Um, and then one of the interesting things that happened, this is basically how they spread their, their reserves. So if we look at the first panel here, uh, this is the bioregions that they were used um, for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And essentially what happened was they got huge groups or groups of experts um, on the Great Barrier Reef into, into Gabrumpa and sort of said, um, where is everything? Where are the different habitats? Is this reef different to this reef? What's in these areas? And there's probably some people in this room that contributed a large amount uh, to this, this sort of this map. And they came up with these 70 different bioregions. 30 of them were coral reefs. 40 of these non-reefs. And then they said, all right, we want to protect at least 20% of each of these bioregions, so each of these habitat types. So then what we did was say, all right, you know, this is great. This is very, clearly very effective at protecting um, all these unknown features incidentally. But what if you just spread your reserves uh, basically in a grid across these biophysical gradients? How would you go? And so that's what these three scenarios are. So this is 70 bioregions, so the same number of this as this. This is 35 and this is 140. So it doesn't matter how big or small your grids are. And what we actually found was that in terms of incidental representation of unknown features, uh, that all of these models basically performed, extreme, um, performed equally well. So this is important because what it shows is that, um, how you, that distributing your reserves across the network is really important in terms of protecting different types of features. And then, but also, if you're thinking about an area like the Coral Triangle, where you're never going to have uh, exhaustive scientific data about where different habitats are, you can actually very effectively implement pr protected areas that um, incorporate, um, even incidentally protect, unknown biodiversity in deep water or things that you didn't even know were there, if you take these robust approaches. So that's just a, a little bit of stuff I've been working on recently. Uh, but for my future research, I have two really um, key areas that I'm interested in pursuing uh, moving forward. First is to continue mesophotic coral biodiversity. And the second one is to apply trait-based approaches um, to ecological and applied questions. So, mesophotic research first. So, mesophotic research has been in a very descriptive or uh, discovery phase recently. So a lot of the mesophotic research that's happened over the last 10 years has been things like biodiversity surveys. So we go somewhere like the Great Barrier Reef or we go in you know, Curacao or wherever it is and we say, all right, what's down there? This is the community, these are the corals that are there, these are the fish that were there, these are that area we kept or whatever. Um, a lot of new species descriptions because they're so unknown, so we're constantly getting new species described from these habitats. And also some work on things like connectivity. So our mesophotic populations connected to the shallow, are they connected to other mesophotic populations? That's pretty much been the research that's been going on. And we're really only scratching the surface uh, in this regard. So mesophotic research um, has, is still very much focused in a few areas, the Great Barrier Reef being one, parts of the Caribbean and Hawaii. So I've been involved in a large um, report on mesophotic reefs for UNEP uh, that lasts a while, and that's got a good figure that shows where mesophotic research has been distributed. Uh, but there's still these vast areas of the ocean out there that are likely to support mesophotic reefs uh, that we don't know. So a couple of the questions I'm interested in are things like, what are the latitudinal limits of mesophotic coral reefs? So there's been some interest recently in, um, you know, as you get to high latitudes, there's less light. So does the depth at which mesophotic corals occur uh, shallow as you get towards higher latitudes? And another thing is, do mesophotic depths in the coral triangle purport, uh, support highly diverse ecosystems? So we know about how incredibly diverse the shallow reefs in this region are. Um, are mesophotic reefs also um, diverse in, this, in the same way? Um, but we also need to understand, I think, the ecological processes that are structuring mesophotic communities. So to do this, we can use trait-based ecology to address ecological and conservation-based questions. And another thing which I won't have time to talk about today, but something I'm very interested in, is how we can use these advances in technology, so things like drones and AUVs and stuff like that, um, to try and address these questions as well. So firstly, mesophotic reefs in the coral triangle. So I have a couple of postgraduate students, um, 
that are working in Kimby Bay in Papua New Guinea as part of Jeff Jones has a large research program up there. And the coral diversity of mesophotic depths up there is really quite extraordinary. Um, one of my students is working on that, uh, trying to describe that biodiversity. Um, but also just the abundance of coral. So even when you get down to 40, 50 metres in Kimby Bay, uh, the, the coral biodiversity, uh, the coral abundance is exceptionally high. You've usually got coral cover at least 40, 50%. And there's particularly a high abundance of these deep specialist aquaporas. And I find these really particularly interesting. So a cropper is one of these words, the most diverse uh, genus of shallow water corals. Um, but the more I look at these, the more I'm convinced that the taxonomy and ecology, in particular of these ones, is very poorly resolved. They're extremely abundant. There's heaps of them. They're all very strange, and we know very little about them. So I'd really like to try and get onto um, understanding the diversity of these deep water aquapora. And Looking at the coral triangle, this is something that we can really link in with other groups that are doing this sort of research, particularly on other taxa. So um, collaborations with, um, I've got colleagues at the Bishop Museum in Hawaii that are really looking at fish and gorgonians in particular, and also groups like Conservation International. They're always looking at, um, at the biodiversity, particularly in these coral triangle regions as a way of promoting conservation. Um, people like Mark Erdman, have been uh, collecting and describing many, many new fish from, from areas like West Papua, um, down from these mesophotic depths. So my other interest is at the other end of the spectrum, uh, mesophotic coral reefs at high latitude. So the southern Great Barrier Reef uh, supports extensive submerged banks. So um, here I've just called them the northern shoals. So you can see this is the Bunker <coughs> Bunker Group, this is the Swains, Heron Islands here. I've just called them the northern and southern shoals, and both of these has been some preliminary work uh, that aims at using brubs in these areas. And then also the Gardner Banks down here off Fraser Island. And most of these banks are about 15 to 20 metres depth on top. And we know that they're occupied by corals. So this is some research that, or some data that was collected recently by AUV. And hopefully you can see that, but this is basically a huge stand of aquifer. <coughs> so this went on for like at least a kilometre, as long as the AUV went. So this bank, which is actually down here in the southern shoals, we just went over it for miles and miles, and it was just a proper. So this is a very interesting area. Firstly, to know about uh, what species are there. So looking at the data, there's, a, there's at least, you know, there's a, there's a number of species there. Um, but also whether this area might present a refuge for corals in, in, from, for the GPR. So this isn't actually a particularly new idea. Uh, so there were some geologists that I've worked, for, I've worked with from the University of Sydney, but are now retired. Um, that were looking into this question in the, in the 1980s and 1990s, but more from a geological perspective. Have these areas supported this, um, have these areas supported coral biodiversity or higher coral biodiversity in the past? Uh, so that's something I'd really like to move into moving forward. And then moving even further south, um, this is a project that I've recently um, started working on with um, Andrew Baird at the centre, uh, and also, and me is involved as well, but also some researchers from the University of Wollongong and Geoscience Australia, and it's basically focused on the biodiversity of the Lord Howe Rise. So Lord Howe Island is the southernmost coral reef in the world. And uh, what we found when looking at this, this is data collected by Toe Video, is that even though we're at 31 degrees south, so Paul's Pyramid is actually, it's very close to Lord Howe Island, it's actually south of Lord Howe Island, that we actually found there was a very high abundance of sclerotinian corals at depths between about 30 and 70 metres. So uh, all of these um, different types of fabids and things like that, and even aquacora are growing at depths down about 50 metres at 31 degrees south out on the Lord Howe Rise. One of the interesting things is that there were, already we found some new records of corals for Lord Howe Island. So there's species occurring in the mesophotic um, that are shallow, typical shallow water species, um, but they've never been described previously from the Lord Howe Island region, but they are down at mesophotic depths. Um, there's also interesting that there's fossil reef growth <coughs> in the area. So these corals are growing on fossil reefs. So they're reefs that were actually actively accreting, so not just coral growth, but actually reef accretion um, that was at, the, at these latitudes at some point in the past. So this is really important for understanding the implications of climate-induced range expansion uh, for coral reefs. So the second thing, moving more on to, I guess, trying to understand the mechanisms of... Um, of mesophotic reefs, so mechanistic understanding of how they work, um, I'd like to use trait-based ecology, um, which provides many advantages for understanding community assembly over the traditional methods that are based on 
species. And so trace-based analyses give, a net, give generality and predictability across ecosystems. And they've really been employed a lot, particularly in terrestrial systems, but increasingly in marine. And what you can do is you can use traits of species to um, ask questions like, what traits are linked to species propensity to do things like have a large geographic range size, um, potentially to expand geographic range to track climate velocity, so what things are linked to whether a species is likely to be able to do that or not. And what species can occur over broad depth range, splitting shallow or mesophotic reefs? Why can some species occur across a broad depth range and others can't? Uh, this is a paper we <coughs> published looking at this exact question for coral reef fish, and we actually found that across disparate <coughs> assemblages, so in the Western Pacific, in Ponape, in Hawaii, which is also in the Pacific, but basically in order of magnitude, less diverse, and in the Caribbean, that the same traits, which were basically to do with the shape of the fish's tail and also its diet, could predict whether they occurred over a broad depth range or not. And MCQ provides a really good opportunity to be able to analyse these questions because they have very large collections of coral and also a, a proper database um, that we can extract a trace, really detailed traits for a lot of coral species to be able to use in these sorts of analyses. And it's a very opportune time to do this because this coral traits database is just about to go live. So this is a project that's been led by Josh Maiden and Andrew Baird, but it's got a huge number of contributors, some of which are probably in the room here. And basically it's just a huge open access resource of trait information on all these different aspects of coral biology. And uh, this paper will be shortly coming out in Nature Scientific Data that describes the database, all the different traits, how to access it and so forth. So there has been a little bit of research already done using this database um, for um, understanding different aspects of coral biology. So this paper came out a couple of years ago that was led by uh, Sally Keith. And basically what it, used, what it did was use traits um, to try and understand why or the, the current biogeographic patterns of coral biodiversity in the Indo-Pacific. And so I'd like to use a similar sort of approach to answer a number of other um, related sort of questions. So things like, can traits predict the composition of mesophotic coral assemblages? So which traits are associated with, with uh, depth general species? So if we go to deep communities in Lord Howe Island and in Kimby Bay and in Hawaii, are the same sort of traits predicting which corals live in the mesophotic compared to those that live in the shallow across these areas that have very different species pools? Um, do geographically distant and taxonomically distinct mesophotic assemblages dis display functional convergence? So do mesophotic habitats exert selective pressures on the species that can live there? Do, is there environmental filtering occurring? And then if depth range is a key predictor of the ability of species to cross bio biogeographic barriers, which is one of the key um, findings of that paper that I just showed you, are latitudinal and longitudinal diversity gradients less steep on mesophotic coral reefs? So that paper basically suggested that one of the, the traits that could predict, one of the, the traits that best predicted the species' ability to cross these biogeographic barriers was that they, um, that they could occur in deep water. So species that had broad depth ranges. So if these species that have broad depth ranges and likely to occur in mesophotic reefs, if they occur, if they cross all these barriers and occur basically everywhere, do we see that mesophotic assemblages uh, basically across, say, French Polynesia, and the Coral Triangle and potentially East Africa, are they composed of the same species, just these real generalists, or not? These are the sorts of questions that we can get at with this trait-based approach. And these approaches, they don't necessarily be, need to be restricted to corals. So we can look at multiple taxa. So we can look at gorgonians. We can look at fish within the same sorts of analyses. And so we can really um, start to understand mechanisms. If we say, even across quite disparate taxa with very different biologies and life histories, we're starting to get the same site types of traits that are predicting um, these sorts of things, like geographic range size. So the last thing that I'm interested in, been working on recently, is things like using traits to look at the differences in diversity metrics between species richness and functional richness. So this is a paper that came out um, for fish in Nature a couple of years ago, and basically what it shows that's important. So if we look at this is species density, which is essentially species richness and functional group richness. And basically this shows the well-described pattern that there is an increase in diversity as you move away from the equator, and there's a particular uh, centre of diversity around this area in the coral triangle. But if we look at these different functional metrics, so functional diversity, 
Uh, we actually find that the patterns of diversity can be quite different. And this can be really important for understanding uh, things like how, so how functional groups are distributed and how functional diversity is distributed. It's important for understanding things like how um, ecosystem function may be affected by things like species range shifts. So it's not just an esoteric exercise, as I said. So mesophytic reefs are very difficult to survey. You're never going to be able to go out and uh, replicate you know, things like Terry surveys where you get to go across the entire Indo-Pacific and survey deep reefs. It's just too expensive. So using these trait-based approaches is really important because we can make very general statements about the nature of mesophytic reefs. So traits can be used to understand assembly rules influencing and structuring mesophytic communities without necessarily going to this exhaustive survey effort. And just as an example, um, this is a, a paper that was recently, uh, well, is about to be published, and it's been accepted by my colleague, colleague Osmo Luis, uh, in Conservation Letters. And essentially what he did was apply this approach to these sort of data deficient environments. So in this particular case, he was looking at gropers. And they're obviously a very um, common fishery target species. And so the IUCN has gone and looked at um, which species are most threatened. Uh, but the problem was a huge number of the species are data deficient, so we don't really know. So what Osman did was he used this trait-based approach to say, all right, here's the species where we know it. These are the traits that they have. And then using these, what traits are most likely to make these species um, vulnerable or, you know, or not? So basically we can say, all right, we know that these traits are associated with the vulnerable species and these ones not so much so. So applying this to the data deficient species, we can now say that, well, for these data deficient species, we don't really know, but these ones are likely to be much more uh, endangered than these ones. So if you're looking at prioritising um, conservation uh, money or actions, you can probably target it towards these types of species that are more likely to require conservation actions. So that's... Um, a summary of my talk, so just some um, publications, so some of these my publications, most of them in the last five years or so, um, some of them are very much um, sort of pure research and some of them more applied research. And um, thank you very much to all these different people.